Hey, it's Mark, and I'm back with another episode of Finding Your Summit. I have not done these intros in, gosh, it seems like about six weeks in my place. Substituting was Pete Turner, my producer for the podcast. I really appreciate him doing all the work he did. Why? Because I was down in Antarctica climbing a crazy mountain called Vincent Massif and so fired up uh, because I have now tackled and taken on my six of the seven summits. I now have Mount Everest in my sights for April um, of 2020. So I've got about 13, 14 months to get my thing together, to get in the right kind of shape, and then make my way over to Nepal, land in Kathmandu, and then uh, take on the you know biggest and baddest boy on the block. I cannot wait for that. And uh, it's certainly going to motivate me like I've never been motivated to, to get after it. And that's that. This week on the podcast, I've got a guy by the name of Akshay Nanavarti. And this is a guy that wrote a book called The Secret of Fearvana. And this guy went through all kinds of hardship. You know, back in the day when he was growing up, uh, he bounced from kind of city to city, town to town. He originally um, came from another country and then uh, just found himself making all the wrong choices. I'm sure we've all been there. You know, do you take door number one or door number two? And in his case, he it t- took the wrong ch- choices, made the wrong choices, and was hanging out with the wrong people. And so he um, uh, was drinking, taking drugs, and all this kind of stuff. So um, he saw this movie called Black Hawk Down. If you've never seen it, it is fantastic. It inspired him to join the Marines. What he really lacked was that discipline, that day-to-day thing that uh, motivates all of us to get us out of bed, make the right choices, and uh, he did that. And um, he joined the Marines. He went out. He served in Iraq. And, you know, one of the things that he ran into was the the survivor's guilt. You know, a lot of buddies that he had become close with did not make it back. And uh, for him to come back here and then really discover uh, what, um, you know, the void and why did he survive and all this stuff. And, and so ultimately what he decided that he needed to do is really step and embrace your fears and chase it. And so out of that, he started doing all these crazy things. So he's like trekked across every country in the planet, <laughs> literally walking, um, you know, he's mountain biking and climbing and, and uh, been in the Himalaya. And uh, he goes around and he talks to different people and coaches them about how they can attack their fears and step into it and become a better person. So that is who is on the pod. Uh, this guy's got a lot of energy and, um, and it was just super fun to, to engage with him. Um, as I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, uh, before that I took off for Antarctica, I did develop a new e-learning course. There's an assessment, which is free. There's a free uh, PDF, which you can download, which are all the things that I had to do to really uh, get to where I am today. Many of these things are things that I learned from uh, my Hall of Fame coaches, Don James, Jim Morris Sr., others um, that really understood the pyramid of success. And so uh, I think we all go through those times. Uh, That's why the name of this podcast is called Finding your summit, but where you're trying to elevate your game, you may be stuck, you may be wanted to elevate, you know, in a relationship that you're in, you may just have things rolling for your life right now, but it's just not enough because you've hit a lot of uh, plateaus or you've hit a plateau and now you want to get to a higher peak. And this can help you give the right kind of the tools, the strategies that uh, it certainly helped me. And so you can find uh, these things, also my expeditions, my public speaking, all those things collected all in one spot at www.markpattisonnfl.com. And then there's various tabs, e-learning course, expeditions, public speaking, all those things. So you can find that there. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Violets Are Blue, skincare.com, Cynthia Besteman. She's a rock star. That's that. Okay, so let's go listen to Akshay and listen to the pod. Here we go. Hey, this is Mark, and I'm back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And this week, I've got a total stud. This guy has come from the ashes and uh, risen and he's living a life of fulfillment. It's going to be very interesting to go through this long and winding story of his, uh, how he got to where he got to, and then how he got himself out 
of his situation. His name today is Akshad Nanavarti. Akshad, how you doing? Doing very well, my friend. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, now, listen, I'm beaming all the way from Sun Valley, Idaho, my World HQ recording studio to New Jersey. Are you uh, you staying warm there? Yeah, it's not so bad. It's 70 degrees. I just got back from a little run, so enjoying it. No complaints. <laughs> that's, uh, that's great. Listen, okay, so we've got a lot to cover, and uh, the first thing I want to say is just to give you my full-on respect and salute for serving uh, your country, my country. Uh, you were in the Marines, and uh, as I was reading how you got into the Marines, um, uh, you know, one day you were watching Black Hawk Down, fantastic movie, intense mm-hmm. movie. Um, Mm -hmm. I believe that's when the helicopter was flying over Somalia and Mm -hmm. it got shot down and then just this craziness ensued after that. But, but how did that all come about? Uh, you know, I moved to the U S from from India. India. I was born in India, moved to the U S when I was 13. Soon after that, got pretty heavily into drugs for about a year and a half was in drugs. I've always been a a person who kind of pushed the limits of everything. And in that case, I was pushing the limits of drugs. I was the first person to get into hard drugs. And in my group, me and one other guy, and he's no longer alive today. I lost two friends to addiction. Mm. Uh, but thankfully, after about a year and a half of that, I saw that movie Black Hawk Down, and that was a trigger that transformed my life because watching that movie and the courage of men giving everything for another human being was tremendous. It triggered something in me about what kind of human being would be able to do that. And uh, clearly, I didn't like that. I was living a fairly selfish and meaningless existence. So I almost overnight, I mean, after watching the movie, I read the book and read book after book on military and combat and almost overnight stopped doing drugs and decided to join the Marines. But it took a little bit to even navigate that because I have a blood disorder that two doctors told me would kill me in boot camp. So I had to sort of fight my way into the Marines. And that took about a year as well, a year and a half to do that before I finally went to boot camp. Yeah, so 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 we're gonna bounce around just a little bit. So I'm I'm just trying to. You came to the U.S. when you were 13, mm-hmm. and trying to kind of set this whole thing up in terms of you know why for some reason you you turn to drugs, some people turn yeah. to sports. You know, it's just. I mean, at the end of the day, it's where you end up, not where you start, right? Um, so, what was life for you uh, growing up in Bombay, India? Uh, so, I was born in Bombay, moved to Bangalore when I was three. So, lived in Bangalore from three to eight. Uh, you know, again, I was, I was again one of those people who just pushed the line. So I was very into sports. I did all was well in school. I was sort of a leader in the classroom, you know, and, uh, and excelled in sports. And then I moved to Singapore when I was eight. So we moved around a lot. Even in Singapore, I, I, I would always be downstairs playing. I mean, I would do things like running barefoot on rocks just to test myself and, and strengthen my feet, you know. So I was kind of, I, like looking back, I realized I kind of had that energy a lot in me. And um, when I moved to the U.S., I guess it, got, it just got channeled in a negative way. And I don't, you know, I don't blame my friends because I take full responsibility for my actions. But I, if I, like, for example, if I'd gotten a group of people who were rock climbers or ultra runners, I probably would have just immersed myself in that world. So I was, I was very um, at the effect of my environment. I wasn't sure who I was, who I wanted to be. And as a result, I sort of molded to my environment and then took that to an extreme in every way. And that's kind of what led me down that path when I moved over here. Because again, I wasn't sure who I was, what I wanted, and uh, and so I got lost and started to embrace that running away from from everything and, and pushing the line in drugs in every way I can. Yeah, I think the other part of that too is when you are bouncing, I mean, it's one thing to trade schools. Like, you know, you're, you, you, yeah. you grew up in Seattle, and I, you know, and I stayed at the same school, but say if I would have started at, you know, school one, the big, the, the big city school there was Roosevelt, and then I would have gone to another school within the same city. I mean, it's a, it's a stretch and it's hard, but it's not impossible, right? And you're talking about yeah. moving entire countries. And so yeah. as a kid, you know, the natural thing to do, of course, is just to try to fit in the best that you can yeah. and you want to be accepted right so it would make total sense to me if that you know when you move in and you know one day you're here and the next not not only you are a different school but you're in a whole new country and there's a new language and all these different yeah. things that you're having to overcome and then some guys bring you into their group and it's just kind of the quick fix and you know that's what it sounds like that you fell into a little bit 
Yeah, and then in that group, you know, I was the one who stood out because I would do all kinds of crazy things. I mean, beyond just pushing a line of drugs, I'd be like throwing knives in the air and catching them. Like, I don't know how in many ways I'm still alive today some of the dumb things that I did. Uh, I have marks on my arm from cutting myself and burning my arm with a cigar, you know? So just in every way pushing the line. And, and it made me stand out. Like I was this crazy kid in the group, you know, <laughs> who did all these things. And so it kind of made me stand out and get that recognition in some way, uh, obviously in a very negative way. Uh, but. It, it, it did make me stand out. And yeah, moving four cities by the age of 13. And then in my senior year of high school, I moved to Minneapolis. So, you know, five cities by the time I graduated high school. Um, so it was a lot of moving around and that required a lot of figuring out. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be the same, you know, if I come from it from the place that I am today. But when you're a kid and you're lost, it, um, it, it definitely kind of sent me down a trajectory of just still figuring out who I was and who I wanted to be. Well, look, at, um, I think no matter what path you're on, at some point in time in your life when you're growing up, you're going through adolescence into mm-hmm. you know, your teens and on, you know, we all question ourselves. And, yeah. and you know, fortunately for some, it's it's the people you hang out with, uh, well, I guess for all. And, and you know, you hope, hopefully that you, as you look back on these things, you're around positive influence that really shape your career. And, uh, you know, I was watching this uh, documentary last night on Steve Largent, another guy I've had on this podcast. The guy ultimately became a, an all-pro. He was, you know, like 5'9", five, 5'10", five, a buck 85, playing in the NFL, set every NFL record. And wow. his, his dad completely abandoned him um, when he grew when he was growing up. And so, you know, who he uh, mm. gravitated t- towards was not drugs, but he loved sports, but the coaches within the, within the, the sports mm. and football team. Mm. So, you know, same type of principle. Um, it's just, you know... It's just influences are, are so important. Okay, so so now you're you're in high school, and you're finishing up in Minneapolis, and I believe you went on to college before joining the Marines, correct? Yeah, so my plan was to go because by the time I moved to Minneapolis, is the point I already made a decision to join the military. Uh, so I moved. Then we moved to Minneapolis, which in many ways was like I I don't think if I had stayed in Austin, I would have continued drugs because I had made this decision. But at the same time. It probably was, you know, looking back, it probably was a good thing to get out of the environment because new drugs started coming into the picture. My, my friends were still involved in the senior year. So, you know, it was kind of a, a good thing. I moved out Minneapolis. I was just kind of isolating myself and just focusing on my training. And I wanted to go right after high school. But again, it took a while to uh, to get in because of that medical condition that I have. And I have to get medical waivers because it was a disqualifying condition. So I still remember applying late admission to college because I finally realized I couldn't go to boot camp right after high school. So I was like, I guess I'll go to college. And I applied to one school late admission and thankfully got in <laughs> so that worked out well <laughs> yeah and then after my one year, freshman year in college then i finally then i took a semester off to go to boot camp and infantry school okay so did you finish up college before you went on to in into the marines or did you you went yeah. one year and then boot camp and then off to, uh, off to yeah then, then i joined the reserves then i did another year and a half in college and then my junior year about uh after my junior year that's when i went to i was deployed to iraq I mean, I was volunteering every chance I could get, though. Like, I wanted to go. Every, uh, since I joined them, since I came out of the infantry school, I was the. It was me and this one other kid. Uh, where every chance we got, we were like, "Send us to war," you know. Uh, but they. Uh, but twice the Marines told us we're going, and then last minute canceled it. Uh, paperwork and stuff like that. Administration doesn't always run very smoothly <laughs> in the Marines. So yeah. So so then go back to what somebody had told you earlier about the your blood disorder. What what was going on there? I have this disorder called thalassemia, so essentially I have less hemoglobin in my blood, and hemoglobin is what transports oxygen. So that's obviously not good if you have less oxygen flowing through your blood for uh, for you know for physical fitness. And so it was. So that's why we went to two hematologists that told us this would this would, this this is that they could not sort of sign the letter that they would recommend. So finally, I had to go to a third hematologist uh, who gave me a letter of approval that I then took to the Marines, and then I still had to get their uh, approval and get all these medical waivers. Uh, so I have to get like yeah, I mean, and that, that's what took so long is to get a medical waiver because again it was a disqualifying condition. Honestly, in today's Marine, like in a, in a peacetime Marine Corps, I don't know if I would have been able to go in. But this was post 9/11, right? And uh, they had an eager body who wanted to go infantry, and so uh, it might have been uh, it might it might have been a factor that influenced their their allowing me to join the Marines. Mm, yeah. So the irony of all this is that um, based on on this type of disorder that you have. It would seem logical to me, at least, that that would be something that would trigger um, fatigue, right? Because you don't have as much oxygen flowing to your 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 your, brain yeah. and your body and everything else. Yet you're the always the guy with the highest energy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, today I certainly have like like for even when I first decided to join the Marines, 
I always thought of this as a barrier. Like I was like, oh, I'm never going to be that fit. I have this thing. And it was sort of like from that fixed mindset, you know, that this is fixed. And today it's, it, I love it. Like it's just an opportunity for me to keep proving that I can rise above it. Because beyond, I mean, you know, as, as you know, I'm an ultra runner today. And not only do I have thalcemia, I have flat feet, I have scoliosis. I have another like condition where my body, because my villi and my esophagus are worn out. So my body's not able to absorb nutrients too well. These are four things that do not make you ideally suited to be an ultra runner. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let alone anything. But uh, but today it's all, it is what it is. And so I look at it as a beautiful opportunity to rise above that and as it, like rise above that obstacle to keep pushing the line. And that's why now it's a gift. It's not at all something that I see as a burden, which I once did a long time ago. And when you're talking about ultra running, how far are you, you, you going? Uh, I, I, I'm currently, I've done, I mean, my longest in one stretch, it's not that big right now. What is it? 33, 34 miles. But I just got back from Liberia where I did about a marathon a day for seven days. Uh, so I, I don't do races as much. I've just done 150 K is the only race I've done. Most of my running long distance is, is, is on my own terms, like just on my own. And I like doing these back to back, uh, long runs across countries. So that's why I just returned from Liberia where I ran. Uh, 167 miles in seven days so just under a marathon a day and i have some much bigger runs planned down the road i probably i will do not probably i will do a 50 miler before the end of the year do a few hundred milers next year in preparation for some other bigger runs as well so the running has evolved dramatically i recently partnered with hammer nutrition that's one of the, the that's in, in you know my opinion and having even before i got sponsored by them this was why i reached out to them they are the best uh, nutrition and supplement company for endurance athletes so Partnering with them has helped me transform my running because I'm putting the right things in my body and uh, helping me fuel myself in the right way, which, you know, you're an athlete. You know how important that is. Uh, it's everything, man. It, it is everything. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get back to this here in a minute. But um, uh, I want to get into the progression of now you go – you finally get that call and, yeah. and now you're, you're going off to, to Iraq. And, 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 and excuse me if I say this incorrectly, but one of the jobs that you were tasked with was to go out, be in front of these different – caravans of trucks and be the guy looking out for the IEDs, essentially those those explosives that that the uh, the enemy, um, the Taliban, would plant in and under the surface and then when the truck or you know something else with weight goes over it, it, it explodes. Is that correct? Yeah, in this case, it wasn't so much a weight thing, it was radio, but the, the principle is the same. It was more radios and wires that were, that's how they used the bombs. But yes, the principle is the same. It was IEDs. And my job, along with one of the Marines, was every time we got to a sort of a danger zone, like let's say a bridge, for example, where bombs could be planted on the side, we would, one of the Marine and me would walk on the left side and right side and look for these bombs before they could be used to blow up our convoys. So, yeah, somewhat, somewhat of a dangerous job. <laughs> yeah, so how did you get the luggage straw? I mean, if I'm sitting in, you know, there's like 10 dudes and, you know, you're all sitting in the circle and you pull out your straw, so I, I would like rig that thing so that I did not pull the straw but I've got to be in front and, you know, sniff out that bomb. <laughs> it was it was kind of weird how I got selected for the role I got selected for in, in out there because before going to war, while we were in the five month of active duty training, the workup for the war, I made a very conscious effort to study the principles of counterinsurgency, to study Arabic, you know. And so during my spare time, I was spending a lot of time studying this. So they noticed that my officers, so they pulled me into the intelligence section of the infantry unit. I was originally a squad leader because I was a corporal, so in charge of 12 Marines, but they removed me out that which initially i was just really upset by i tried to go back to being uh, you know leading my squad but in hindsight it worked out for the best because uh, being in the intel cell i was a sort of small cell uh, i got i got to experience many different roles in the war like that was one of my jobs is what i said because i would be going and, and i mean my squad because again of where i was um we went out on missions more than any other squad in the entire battalion of over a thousand marines because we were out there every single day i mean in the entire seven months we must have gotten like a week off total you know we were out there every single day and it was again tough while we were there there were days we just wanted a day off but um in hindsight, I'm grateful for it because it, it, it allowed me to have a more intense experience. And, and through through intense experiences, we evolve, right? So it's not always easy when you're in it. But that's why I got that's, – that's, like, through that, that's how I ended up one of these roles was this in the vehicle convoys because I was in the back of the 7-ton or the MRAP or whatever it was. And so when we got through, it was like, all right, now body, get out, <laughs> you know, with one other guy. And, uh, and that was just, again, one of my jobs. Many I had many other roles throughout the – throughout my seven month deployment out there. Yep, and, and how often were you encountering enemy fire? Not very often. That was not our big threat. Like we would get we would have days where rounds would pop off and stuff like that. 
But, I mean, you're talking about a bunch of crazy Marines. Like, when rounds pop off, everybody's looking for where the fire's coming. Like, we're, you know, like, bring it kind of thing, you know? Nobody's, like, trying to run away. Everybody's just kind of, like, bring it. It's on, you know? So we had days where they'd pop off. But the rules of engagement were also very different because at this point in the war, uh, you know, if, if we were getting rounds popped off while driving to a city, our rules were not to engage because we, we had to, we wanted to, I mean, not have to, but again, it was the right thing to do, I think. We're not trying to kill civilians. We don't want to prevent that collateral damage, you know? So often the rounds would pop off, but at this point also, we we had those up armor Humvees, the up armor MRAPs, which are just, I mean, like tanks on the road. So the insurgents knew that if you engage a bunch of crazy Marines with incredible weaponry in a firefight, you're more than likely going to lose, you know? So um, so that's why we didn't get a lot of that. Like, I mean, and, and a lot, honestly, a lot of when they were engaging us in firefights, like one day they shot a rocket, and I think, I'm guessing they were trying to hit our base, but they missed, and they, uh, or they just didn't aim it right or whatever it was, and they hit the village right across from us and killed four Iraqis, you know? So they were killing more of the locals than they were killing us. Our biggest threat was those IEDs, but thankfully our unit did a really good job of finding them before they could blow us up. Because the unit after us got hit a few times by those IEDs, and I believe they lost some people. Um, we had one company, one vehicle in our company get hit, but thankfully nobody was killed. Uh, they did get evacuated and they were hit with an IED, but nobody was killed in that in that bombing. That was really our biggest threat, not so much the firefights. Like Again, we had rounds pop off, but nothing crazy. Yeah, well, look, the whole time just being in there, I, I mean, I, I would think that just the presence of being in a um, – in a country, in a city uh, where there is conflict and which you don't know, you don't know, and that creates anxiety, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's that, that's the challenge in counterinsurgency warfare because you don't know who is your enemy, you know? And so you could be walking through a city and, again, 99% of us didn't want to kill an innocent person. So you could be walking through a city and you, you, want, you want to make friends with these people. You want to – you were there to help them. I mean, again, separate from all the politics of the war, shouldn't have gone and all that. But being on the ground in 2007, we were there to help them. And so nobody wants to kill an innocent person. But at the same time, you don't know if that one person who wants to is the one who wants to kill you. You know, like just as a small example, what the insurgents started doing is sometimes they would wear the burqas and dress up like women, and because they knew that we wouldn't, out of respect for women, we wouldn't, you know, pat down a, a woman. And so what they started doing is wearing these burqas, and they would strap suicide vests on, uh, under them. And, uh, and so every time we would, uh, thankfully we never, you know, met that, uh, like saw someone do that, but we, but that was happening. So when we met women, we'd often look at their feet to see if they had sort of manly looking feet. Um, but that kind of, so that, that you're kind of on edge as a result the whole time, cause you never know. And we had instances where like crowds would form and, and everybody's a little on, on edge and high alert, you know, cause you're constantly on high alert because you just don't know who is, who is the one who wants to kill you. And if you make a wrong decision, you either could kill an innocent person or you could get you and your Marines killed. Yeah. And either way, either way, that's a not, not a good thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's crazy. The whole thing is yeah. nuts, right? Um, but that's that's war and that's conflict that's, and that's engagement and all those things. And, and also part of those is what we're going to talk about next. So we, we opened up the show and, you know, again, the, the name of this podcast is Finding Your Summit. Maybe it should be called Finding Your Summits. And one of the summits that you overcame was the – uh, uh, the drug uh, stuff that you were doing as an adolescent and then you move past that and you get past your blood thing and uh, you go to war and now you're you're involved in this type of conflict uh, and now you're coming out of it and now you um, have a condition of PTSD mm -hmm. and along with I, that, right? Yes. Yeah. I struggled when I got back home. I mean, I actually wanted to go back to war. Uh, there's a kind of simplicity of purpose, of action, and clarity of that and also you get that high that's very addictive, to be honest with you. There's an addictive nature to war that uh, people who've been will kind of understand it. And so I wanted to go back. I struggled with life in the civilian world. and um, uh, But then eventually, that again, that didn't happen. And so many years later, after I was, you know, had a corporate job, I quit. And I was doing things to kind of run away from myself that were positive. Like I spent a month dragging a 190-pound sled for 350 miles across the second largest ice cap in the world in temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees. You know, so doing these kind of things. But at the same time, I was running away from myself through alcohol. And um, so I was diagnosed years later with PTSD. And soon after that, the drinking just took a turn for the worst. And until I got to a point that I was on the brink of suicide. And that was the, that was a trigger that, that started helping me get out of that. Yeah. So so we'll, we'll, we'll stay on this for just a minute and then we'll bounce yeah. out of it and talk about all the positivity that you have going on now. But yeah, the, the 
you know, so as you got further and further into all this, it, it, trying to get out of it, right? Do you go to – is there somebody within the, the military that helps you deal and cope with these different things? Do you have to go to a rehab center? I mean how, how do you emerge out of something? And and I also saw something uh, along with this that – well, part of this. I'm not sure if it's all of it, but there was a survivor's guilt, which kind of yeah. led to a lot of this. That, that was, was a huge struggle because, because you know, I said, said when I joined the unit, unit as I mentioned, there was one other guy in me who would volunteer to go to war every chance we could get. And uh, and we became very close. We were a very similar kind of Marines. We would do everything together. And then one summer while I was vacationing in India with my family, he finally found a unit to go with and was activated. And he ultimately got promoted and was killed with an IED. And that hit me hard because when we, when we used to train together, I was beaten by a few points in the rifle range or beaten by a few seconds on the run. So I always felt that if I had gone with him, I should have been the one who got promoted and it should have been me that died instead of him. So that like further reinforced my resolve to go to war. And when I went there, I went there with a very naive and I admit, admittedly naive intention that if somebody's going to die, let it be me. So I was, I was unhappy being in that job, walking in front of IEDs. I was like, I'd rather it be me than somebody else, you know? Uh, so I kind of gave away a lot of my stuff before going to war as if I'm not coming back. And I was ready for that and even kind of in some ways embraced it. Um, so when I came, when I did come back, I struggled with that. Like, what right did I have to come home when my friend did not, when so many others have suffered, you know, so much more than me? And I was whole. I didn't get shot. I didn't lose a limb. What right did I have to do that, you know? And ultimately, what right did I have to be happy or alive or anything? And um, that sent me into a lot of dark places. So that's why I struggled. Um, I felt like I hadn't suffered enough to earn my place in this life. This podcast is brought to you by Laird Superfoods. Let me tell you, these creamers are so amazing. They're super tasty, super delicious. And what they are is whole natural food ingredients mixed into these creamers. And I'm telling you, when you put this this stuff into your drink, these powder substance, it is amazing. And their whole tagline is all about fueling your journey. You cannot go and actually power your way up a mountain Uh, be in the pool, ride a big wave, uh, unless you're properly fueled. And these guys are doing it all the right way. So where can you find this? At LairdSuperfood.com. And here's the kicker. If you use the the code name MarkP20, that's MarkP20, you're going to get 20% off on your first order. So check it out. LairdSuperfood.com. I felt like I hadn't suffered enough to earn my place in this life. And to, day, to this day, I have a picture of my friend that I'm looking at right now. Uh, it says, this should have been you. Earn this life. So my guilt has now become my ally, but that was a huge, huge thing that I kept running away from. Uh, and I just couldn't confront it. And that's what I was doing for writing by drinking so much, is running away from all the realities, all my demons, until I finally learned how to engage those demons and embrace them and actually fall in love with them. I, I could never, ever begin to identify with exactly all the things that you've gone through, right? I, I, I went to college, I played football there, went on to the NFL. I did other things. And, mm-hmm. and so um, to say the survivor's guilt, again, I, I don't want to minimize what I'm about to say, but it, it seems like at the end of the day, once you cut through all the stuff and, you know, very difficult trying situations, it, it's, it gets down to a mindset, and as you were telling me that story um, of why should I have lived, you know, I guess the the opposite end of that would be, I'm so thankful that I made it through, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so, so to somehow or another get across that bridge and have that mindset. And I don't know how you do that, you know, if I was over there with my best friend and they got blown up and, you know, I'm still standing there and I should have gone too. And, mm-hmm. and so I'm not trying to minimize any of this. It's no. just – it just seems like, you know, in order to – at the, the at the very tail end, if you go through all the stuff and it's traumatic and, and there's alcohol involved and depression and all this other stuff, that it, without that mindset of really embracing some of the things that you're talking about, uh, of really, you know, and, and embracing the things that, that you want to do and really live this life and make it meaningful, unless you do that, you're going to continue to go down that same path. A hundred percent. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. That mindset is everything, you know, and that's why when I finally started kind of healing myself, uh, I learned a lot about processing emotions because the thing is a lot of people were telling me like the therapist and the VA friends, family, you know, you shouldn't feel guilty and all these kind of things. And, and rationally, I kind of get it. like, you know, it's war. Randomness happens. Even if I've gone there with them, even, even if I, like we could be strolling down the street in Iraq and somebody could have gotten shot instead of me or, you know, and it could, and that's just the random nature of war. But like, I mean, I'm not the only veteran, of course, who struggles with survivors. Many people do. Right. And I think that's just a natural result of, 
And not again, not just veterans. Many people who lose people struggle with that. So, but it's a natural result, I think, of the camaraderie that forms. That that when you're feeling when you feel so close to somebody, if they die, it's like you know, why them instead of me uh, uh, kind of thing. And so what I learned was uh, through all this research at Vicon is that, you know, these emotions are natural human reactions. It's not the emotion that's the problem. There are no bad or good emotions. No emotion is inherently bad or good. Any emotion can be channeled into something useful. So uh, instead of trying to get rid of the guilt, I was like, and which was almost a futile endeavor. I mean, to this day, you know, it, to this day, it's not something that's conscious and lives in me to the extent that it would, you know, it was in the past. But I feel it. I mean, I look. I have this picture in front of my friend, and from time to time, I engage that guilt. Like I would watch scenes from war movies, knowing they will tear me up, uh, because I consciously engage that guilt uh, in order to embrace it. So, um, so now it's like the emotion is never the problem. It's our conscious reaction to that emotion and how we use it, and that's the mindset that you're talking about. There's a space between our emotion, between our thoughts, between our feelings, and our conscious higher self, and what we choose to do with those things. That space is our destiny, and recognizing and mastering that space is everything. That's how you learn to to really handle the, the, the challenges life throws your way, and the challenges that you pursue in service of your own growth and your own path. So you've got this this great quote that I, I saw. I actually I love this, and I'm probably going to steal it from you. <laughs> and it's called uh, "Embrace Your Fears," right? And what you've done is actually chased it. And this is probably mm-hmm. as a chronological segment between that space in your brain that you're talking about that you had to move from kind of one to the other, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and so that then has led into this whole. Um, book, uh, website, um, kind of everything that you're all about called Fearvana. So what is Fearvana all about? So Fearvana, it's these two seemingly contradictory ideas, right? Fear and Nirvana, bliss, enlightenment, that I have come to learn are very much complementary. And it's embracing the duality of those experiences of our darkness and the light of fear and Nirvana and unifying them as one in service of evolving and finding these new awakenings within ourselves. So I define Fearvana as the bliss that results from engaging our fears to pursue our own worthy struggle. And what I mean by our own worthy struggle is our path, our purpose, whether it's playing in the NFL or hosting a podcast, starting a business, running into marathons, whatever it may be. You find that path and you pursue it. You And, it, and I call it a worthy struggle because it will be a struggle. Sometimes I don't like that idea when kids often hear, follow your passion, because passion is good when you pursue your path. But the point of like when people say follow your passion, it often conveys this notion that if you do, life will be full of sunshine and rainbows, right? But it absolutely won't. It will be a struggle. And that's not a bad thing. So Fearvana is about helping people find, live, and love their worthy struggle. Those three things are really the ethos of what the world of Fearvana and building is all about. Helping people find, live, and love that worthy struggle. And, and ultimately embracing suffering. Like if there's one skill that I would say is the most important skill to, to master in order to live a successful and happy life is to develop a positive relationship to suffering. So when you learn how to suffer well, you will be able to embrace whether life throws things your way because you know life hits you from time to time or whether you're seeking out that worthy struggle and finding it, living it, and loving it, you'll be able to suffer well. You'll be able to enjoy the, the path and enjoy the highs and the lows of the journey. So that's what Fearvana is, is helping help people do is develop that positive relationship to suffering so they can find, live, and love their worthy struggle. Yeah, I, know, yeah, listen, I, I, I love to suffer. I mean, I, I don't say that in some weird way, but – you know, no, I, through, through I two days it. and, you know, climbing up mountains and being in, in minus 40 degrees and crevasses and all those things, you know, you go through a lot of suffering and I really, really, really like get off on it. But, uh, you know, a lot of these things too are you're ramping up to it and you're putting yourself, the more, I think, physically um, prepared you are, the more mentally you can begin to take these things on and understand that pain is temporary and pain being temporary might be a number of years, but you're yeah. going to get through it if you keep chipping away in kind of that meta- metaphorical um, sense of take one step you know, after the other and ultimately you will climb that mountain. And uh, you just got to stay the course and be very clear about what your intention is. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, brother. I fully agree. You know, when you have clarity of that purpose, clarity of action and allow it to consume your soul, you know, uh, I think obsession is a good thing. I think that when it consumes – your path consumes you, that's a beautiful thing. 
And, and like, I mean, you obviously know it with what you've done as an athlete in the NFL and now pursuing the seven summits, uh, you can relate. So, <laughs> but it's a beautiful experience and not, it, it's, it's the suffering as well as your ability to rise above it. When you tap into that space within yourself, you discover something that's magnificent. I mean, it's just the, the it's the, it's the humanity at its finest to transcend our suffering. So you've got, uh, you know, you talk about stepping into your fears. Um, you've done a lot of stuff. Uh, I want to talk about, um, you know, you're walking the walk, you're talking the talk, which is what you need to be, right? If you're, you can't just, you know, promote a book and it's all about, about the flash and not about the substance. And so talking about doing these physical type challenges for you of climbing, mountain biking, scuba diving, um, all these different types of things. I mean, mm -hmm. which of all these different ones have you feared the most but embraced, you know, like has been your greatest challenge to, to overcome and, you know, come off that with your hands up in the air and, and jacked up that you took that thing on? Uh, yeah, I've pursued outdoor sports in almost every terrain you could think of, from skydiving to, yeah, mountain climbing, polar exploration, cave diving, caving, uh, scuba diving, all of it. And uh, to be honest with you, one of, the, one of the most terrifying ones was caving, going into tight spaces and dry in caves. So going dry caving as well as cave diving was pretty scary. Even skydiving terrified me. Uh, I've, I've done nine dives. Even my, my very first dive was a solo dive. And I actually fractured three bones in my foot on my ninth dive in a bad landing. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I haven't gone back since then. Not just I just get, I was soon after that I got activated and everything. But I really want to go back because I'm terrified. So I want to go engage that fear and, and, and go skydiving, which I'm sure I will soon. But caving ranks up there. In terms of my outdoor sport pursuits, Caving was uh, terrifying, and I had some pretty bad experiences in a cave. Like I got diarrhea in a cave once, which was nightmare. <laughs> that was really miserable. <laughs> and you have to you have to like suffer through it and crawl back out. You know there was no two ways about it. And it was an intense cave. Like we were in there for maybe ten to twelve hours top, total. And I think I got got it on the last four hours or so. And I but no choice. There's one way out of that cave, so you got to fight it. And it drains you physically. It drains you emotionally. It just sucks. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. That was a miserable experience. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, yeah. Obviously, you know, talking about funny your 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 summit and overcoming your adversity. But I, I remember it was about six months ago. It might it might have been longer. Where there was this, it was over somewhere and there was uh, a bunch of kids who had gone into a cave and then there was a big flash yeah. flood and essentially the whole cave filled up and so they yeah. re remember this it was you know yeah, like Thailand. Half Thailand. Half what's that it was in Thailand I believe yeah yeah crazy uh, yeah, it would have been terrifying. <laughs> I mean, caves are scary places. There, you know, like it's pitch black. I mean, in a cave, you cannot see your hand in front of you uh, with, without light, obviously. Uh, but like, and, and crawling through these tight spaces is intense. Like in one, in this particular cave where I got diarrhea, there was one point where we're crawling on our back, and the top of the cave is inches above your, uh, uh, you know, inches above your face, and the the water line is on your cheekbone. So you're crawling on your back, and you have these few inches to breathe. And one person would go at a time because. If two people go and one person's panics and splashes, that water's covering your nose. And man, you talk about it, you have to stay calm. <laughs> you know? Absolutely stay calm. Uh, so that was intense. And then I also went cave diving where you're scuba diving into a cave, which was also very intense but deeply spiritual experience. Yeah, so um, I think I'm out on that. Uh, I, I like doing a lot of different things. I don't think that's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a it's you know it's a different world because like mountains. I've done mountaineering, went up to twenty one thousand feet in Nepal, uh, almost twenty one thousand, and you know there are a few other mountains in Bolivia, Alaska, Colorado, all over. And it's terrifying, of course, as you know. There's there's hard moments. It's challenging. There's moments where you feel like you're terrified you could fall and stuff like that. Same thing with polar exploration, getting stuck in storms that you know the following year, British explorer died in one of those storms in Greenland. So these were all intense experiences. But you're kind of in open spaces in nature, and there's a kind of comfort. At at least for me, this could be different for you know for others. But at least for me, there was a comfort in that openness. Whereas in this tight cave, it's a uh, <laughs> it's it's intense for sure. So I need to go back and uh, I kind of want to do a little bit more of that and navigate that down the road as well. <laughs> yep. So now, after all said and done, after these years of of figuring things out and really coming to this place of bliss, um, you have I know you have this this book, but also a website. And the website is, is pretty much set up to invite people to come and, and, and you can show them the, the, the outline and the different um, techniques and whatnot to find their own or help at least people find their own bliss, correct? 
Absolutely. Yeah. I call for Nirvana the birthplace of boundless bliss. And to be very clear, bliss and like happiness, like I always say this, happiness is not the elimination of sadness. Happiness is the ability to find the gift in sadness. So when I say boundless bliss, it doesn't mean you'll be happy all the time. You will experience pain. You'll experience sadness. You'll experience grief. That's just life. But the boundless bliss is the ability to find a gift in all of those experiences as well. And that's what that's what I help people do because I think there's a lot of stuff out there. I think generally speaking, we live in a world that's looking for the easiest path, easiest way out. I mean, we are constantly creating things to make our lives easier, but easier is not better. So in my world, it's about helping people actually embrace suffering and not only embrace it, but seek it out. <laughs> so might not be for everybody, but in all honesty, research itself has shown that that's what leads to happiness. So uh, we live in a world that's causing that. We see people like more obesity, more depression, more mental health issues than ever before because we're constantly trying to make our lives easier and easier. And that's making our lives harder. Well, to me, it's pretty simple. If you're not growing, you're dying, right? And so um, that, <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't mean you have to be stuck necessarily. But I think there's a lot of people – I've got a lot of friends you know, who have done extremely well – and they're at a certain place, but why not go and stretch yourself in, in other directions? You know, it doesn't just have to be the same old thing every day. And that's a choice. And uh, and that's mm-hmm. why I think, you know, people like you are set up and have sites um, that can help people just at least be more aware. And, you know, and, and you can sit back and really think about, hmm, that's interesting. And maybe I should try that. And that's the whole key. Yeah, I mean, 100%, you know, finding ways to stretch yourself, and, and that's what the fear, fear of honor is, uh, is all about, is helping people do that. And even writing writing the book itself is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Writing that book was brutal. <laughs> like, talking about, talking about stretching yourself in different areas. Sometimes I used to go run a marathon just to go procrastinate on writing, you know? <laughs> I was like, eh, I'm not going to write. I'm going to go run a marathon, and then sort of justify to myself that I still did something today, which was ultimately lying to myself, because at the time, that was my worthy struggle, was to write and finish that book. And I'm blessed to say now it's making a big impact, but it was one of the hardest things I've done. So you really have to engage that relentless awareness muscle to figure out, okay, what is really the path? You know, what is my struggle right now? So right now, like it's easy, again, it's easier for me to go run a marathon than it is for me to work on my business. Um, even though running a marathon might be hard, but it's an easier kind of struggle. So I have to like, I have to constantly engage that through self-awareness and then through ultimately through action that, okay, what's the real worthy struggle I need to pursue? And it doesn't mean, of course, you can't do both. I do both. Both, but uh, but I have to balance it out and be more careful about when I'm trying to procrastinate in even those quote unquote positive ways like running or something like that. So of all the things that you you've done, um, and this is the last question for you, and it's the kind of like the the grand finale. So how in the world did you get the Dalai Lama to give you a quote? <laughs> that was a tremendous blessing to uh, to have that for the book. It was it was a pure cold pitch, no connections, nothing like that. I reached out to his website, uh, which kind of got me nowhere. I didn't get a response. So I did a ton of research online and ultimately found one name and one email address for a person in his holiness's office. Reached out to him. He connected me to three other people. So three people later, now I'm connected to this person. I shot a personal video for him, sharing my story, what I'm up to, what Fearvana is all about. All the profits from the book are going to charity. So we're supporting some really beautiful causes around the world. Um, and like after five months of building a relationship with this monk in his holiness's office and five months of navigating that fear, that self-doubt, I kept thinking they're not emailing me back because they hate my book. They're not going to do it. Who am I? All like going through all of that stuff, the who am I syndrome. So and I, and I stress that point, especially because it's OK to have all that voice. It's OK to have self-doubt. It's OK to have who am I syndrome. It's OK to have fear. What matters is you, whether you listen to it or not. Because a lot of people will say, don't feel self-doubt and eliminate fear and all that. And that's nonsense. Like, feel all of those things. That's okay. But you don't have to listen to it. So I felt all of it. But I managed to maintain a, uh, you know, maintain persistence, build a relationship with this monk. And then after about five months, he sent me this email saying, uh, considering everything you've been through and your genuine desire to serve, I'll press your case. And soon after that, I, I got a forward from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And it was beautiful. I didn't even ask for a forward. I had just asked for like a sort of one-liner, but ended up writing the forward for the book. So, it, I mean, it's just been a tremendously humbling. It still sometimes blows my mind when I see the Dalai Lama name on the front of Fearvana. <laughs> it's really, really a blessing. Well, it would have been super cool if it was like something like, you rock, dude. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, hey, listen, where can people find you? Uh, Fearvana.com. And the, the book is also on Amazon at Fearvana. And so you chat to me, I respond to all my own emails, and I'm here to serve in any way I can. No, I really appreciate that. Listen, I really uh, uh, enjoyed the chat today. He is Akshay Nanavarti, and uh, listen, go get him and keep reaching and stepping into your fears, buddy. Thanks for having me on the show, man. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, you too.
Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So, until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.